This is our last day of lectures, and um, you know, this course is ostensibly about uh, using mathematics, estimation theory, and optimal control to think about how the brain works. And we've done a little bit of that, but I thought that at the end we should have um, an example of how the material can come together for you. So rather than talking about classification, which was scheduled today, I wanted to end with a different story. Um, uh, Pavan Waswani is a graduate student in, uh, in my lab who took this course two years ago. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, when you're a graduate student, time is, seems like forever ago <laughs> when you did anything. Anyway, Pavan um, has uh, some very preliminary data, but I think rather beautiful example of how to understand uh, behavior using things that we've been talking about, things like the concepts of an optimal control, the notions of uh, a Bellman equation, and the thought that behavior can be understood if one looks at um, details and thinking about it mathematically in terms of what is optimization. So what's special about um, the work that you're going to see is that Pavan is an MD-PhD student, so he's interested in clinical applications of this. And, and, and I think he's, he's understood something interesting about a particular disease that we would not have been able to understood, understand without the mathematics. So that's what we're going to end the class on, um, a lecture on how to use some of the stuff that you've learned to understand something about the brain. So here's Pavel. Mm. Okay. Hello, everyone. As Riza said, my name is Pavan Vaswani. I'm a grad student in Riza's lab. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about optimal control of saccades in patients with ataxia telangiectasia. Uh, and there will be a quiz on how to pronounce that at the end of the lecture, so uh, do your best. Um, no, so, so the, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about this patient group that I've been working with for the last uh, year or so, um, uh, patients with this disease called ataxia telangiectasia. And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about their eye movements, their saccades, and the, kind of the, the story is kind of thinking about why they make the, saccade, the saccades that they do. So think about that as we go along. Uh, and it turns out that we think that perhaps they're actually using some, some ideas from optimal control and include and some of the some of the kind of homework and lecture I, uh, ideas that you've had recently uh, to uh, make the saccades that they make. So that's a little bit of what we're going to be talking about. Um, this is not math, but I, I think it's important to understand the patients that we're talking about, the disease that we're talking about, because it kind of informs the kind of the point of this work. So at ataxia telangiectasia. Uh, if we break that down, ataxia means kind of discoordination of movement, and telangiectasias are these red kind of spider vein things. They're a, a dermatologic uh, issue. Uh, and so these kids have ataxia, they have telangiectasias, and they have a bunch of other things going on uh, that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but essentially, it's an autosomal recessive and, for our purposes, neurodegenerative disorder. Uh, they have a single gene mutation uh, in a gene called ATM, mutated in ataxia telangiectasia, a very creative name. Uh, and that uh, gene is involved in the cellular stress response uh, and in DNA repair, double-stranded break repair. It does a lot of things in the cell, so it's, it's not exactly clear uh, which of its mechanisms causes the problems that we see. But nonetheless, these kids have a lot of uh, uh, medical problems. Um, it, ha it happens to be the most common progressive cerebellar ataxia protesting before a five-year-old in the US. Um, and it was described in the, the early 20s and then uh, later in the 40s. So there's been a few families that have it. But it's a pretty rare disease. So in the United States, there's maybe five or 600 children that'll have this disease. Uh, Hopkins happens to be one of the, it might be the center in the United States that sees them. Uh, and there's a few others in the world. So it's kind of a, also a unique place to, to get a chance to work with these guys, um, guys and gals. Um, so a little bit more about the disease. Uh, uh, it's a pr so clin uh, on MRI and, and clinically, you see a progressive cerebellar degeneration. So their cerebellums get small. You can see on this figure on the right that the, you can see the gaps between the, the folia of the cerebellums, cere cerebellum uh, in a 14-year-old boy. So they have a loss of, of cerebellar kind of volume. Um, they also have this ataxia that I mentioned. They have oculocutaneous telangiectasias. So they have these bright red spider veins on their eyes and on their skin. Um, they have oculomotor apraxia, which is what we're going to talk, be talking about a little more. Uh, they also have um, these choreatic movements. They have immune problems. They're sensitive to radiation. So they have a lot of other things going on. But the neurological phenotype is that they have ataxia, kind of a discoordination of their movements. And they have oculomotor apraxia, which is You'll see the, the exact uh, phenotype, but they, have, they kind of make the wrong eye movements, it seems like. So that's all the introduction I was giving about the disease. If anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, this particular experiment, we were looking at saccades in children. 
And so I'm just a, it's a very simple experiment, so I'm going to give you kind of just a very brief overview. Basically, what we would have children, both healthy children and patients do, is sit in front of this fancy high-tech camera. Um, they would be looking at a computer screen, and I would present them with a target, a red dot. And then the target would jump to the other side. They would have to look at the other dot. It would jump back. They would have to go look at the first one. Uh, very simple, very straightforward. And the camera would uh, use as an IR kind of um, IR LED and an image to calculate the, the position of the gaze by tracking the pupil and the, the reflection off the cornea. So it's fairly straightforward. We use a camera. It's pretty non-invasive. The kids will tolerate it. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple task. Um, so. Uh, if I looked at the website, and so it looks like yesterday for homework, you guys actually ta thought about um, saccades and why, how people make the saccades that they do. And you guys went through the calculations for making a saccade with signal-dependent noise, and you should have come out with the result that if you have signal-dependent noise, the expectation is that when you make a saccade to a target that's pretty far away, you should fall a little short. Um, so this is kind of a nice example of data in healthy people. That's, that's in fact what people do. So what I'm plotting here is a, is a healthy, 14-year-old boy. Um, on X is time, on Y is the gaze, the, where, where he happens to be looking in degrees. The black line shows where the target is. So you can see that the target jumps 15 degrees to the left, then it jumps 15 degrees to the right, 15 degrees to the left, fairly straightforward as I pointed out earlier. And what you see is that for the most part he gets most of the way there when asked to make a saccade to the target. So sometimes he falls a little short and makes a secondary saccade, sometimes he gets all the way there. Um, but for the most part, as you guys should have come out with your homework yesterday, people kind of go 95 plus percent of the way there when they're making a large saccade. And that's what also what we see in children. I'm just going to point out that occasionally you see something like this, where he jumps maybe two-thirds of the way and then tries to go the rest of the way. Um, but, uh, but that's relatively rare in healthy people. It's extremely rare in healthy people. You see it occasionally. Um, to summarize these data, the reason I'm, I'm doing this plot is because I'm going to highlight the differences between the healthy children and the patients. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically plot across all the healthy children that I, I uh, had come in and do the experiment where they're making their saccade to. So um, to start off with, on the right, on the right you see an example of, for example, a single trial, which you might expect. And in purple, I'm showing that they start off near the start position, which is in the dashed line. And they're trying to go to the target, which is in the solid line. And it's kind of this summary plot of everyone. You see that the dashed line is where they're supposed to be starting. The solid line is where they're supposed to be ending. And they're basically making saccades to a target from positive 20 degrees to negative 20 degrees in this case. And from, um, I'm s yes, and then uh, from negative 20 degrees to positive 20 degrees in the case on the right. And so to start off with in purple, you see that this is partially by selection. I make sure that I select trials where they didn't kind of go too early and they didn't anticipate where the target was going to be. So I kind of enforce that they start near the start position. And then we can see where they jump land after they make their first saccade. So just a little schematic. And the colors aren't super clear, but that's supposed to be blue. So in the first saccade, they tend to land most of the way there on average. They fall a little short for the larger saccades. Uh, and it seems to be like you probably you should have come out with in your homework last night or whenever the last homework was. Uh, that it's kind of a, a scaling of the target position. It's just a gain on the distance to the target. So that's about what we see. Um, and then if you ask them, that many, in some cases, they'll make a second saccade. The endpoint of the second saccade, as you can see in the schematic on the right, is plotted in washed out green. Uh, and that's the endpoint of the second saccade. So you see they get, they get closer, pretty close to the target by the second, second saccade. So this is healthy uh, kids' behavior. It kind of comes out nicely with the math that you did last night uh, or whenever. Um, and it's, uh, it's by contrast, I'll show you what the patients do. So patients, on the other hand, here's two example patients. This boy is seven, and this young man is 25. Um, so we'll just look at the, the boy on the left. You see that he uh, is able to get to the target, but he seems to do it with multiple steps. So he jumps, 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 jumps. So he, and rather than making one, maybe two saccades in order to achieve the target, you see that these kids tend to go maybe halfway or so, maybe a little more than that. And then a little further, and then eventually reach, reach the target. So they make what I'm going to call a series of saccades in order to achieve, achieve the target, instead of basically going most of the way there in one step. For those of you who are eye movement aficionados, you can see that this one person happens to have nystagmus, that he has a, the eye slides in towards the center and then jumps out. Uh, so if anyone notices that, that's what that is. Uh, that's why he's not holding the gaze perfectly. Um, 
And we can summarize these data in the same way that I did for the healthy kids. So we're going to start off by showing that they start off with, start off in purple, again by kind of construction, uh, or it's, this is enforced, um, near the start position, near the starting target. Um, and then the target will jump and they'll make their first saccade. And you see, as opposed to making their first saccade, you know, 75% of the way there, 90% of the way there, they seem to only get maybe halfway um, after the first, first jump. Then they make a second jump, as you can see on the right, in green, and they get a little further. In the third saccade, they get closer still, and by the fourth, third or fourth saccade, they're pretty much smack dab on the, uh, on the, on the target that they're supposed to be getting to. So this is a little strange. Uh, it's kind of odd that you see these kids, instead of going from you know, left, to, or left, to right, left to right, your left to your right, they kind of go halfway, pause, a little further, pause, and a little further. And this is actually one of the patients you can see that they pause for a fair bit of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. That happens to be important. Um, so any questions about this so far? The general kind of the patients that I'm working with, the, uh, the general observation, which is this, this uh, idea that you might want to make a series of saccades to get to the target. We're going to try to tease that apart a little bit. Any questions? Good. Um, so um, the first kind of set of questions we're going to ask is whether the saccades are normal, if there's just something messed up about the way they make their eye movements. So prior work has hypothesized that maybe they're trying to get to the target. They're you know, trying to shoot all the way there, and then something gets messed up. There's uh, maybe the burst generators in the brainstem are getting somehow suppressed in the middle of the flight of the eye. And so the saccades are somehow aborted or altered in flight. Um, and so if that were the case, it's a very reasonable uh, hypothesis, if whether that were the case, there's a few things we might expect in the saccade dynamics. So if we look at the, the profile of the saccade, we might expect that it basically terminates in some way, that we can see this termination, it's somehow altered. Um, and at least initially, we should see that saccades shouldn't look like they're going where they actually go. They should look like they're going somewhere further, somewhere to the target, because we, the, the hypothesis would be that they're somehow getting aborted and kind of shut off. In the middle. So they should, be, they should look at least initially like they're trying to go far and then they fall short. Um, and so basically the saccades may be appropriate in some way for the target distance uh, as opposed to the, the actual distance they go. So we're going to basically look at some of the saccade dynamics and see if this is the case. Uh, it, as a bit of a hint, it turns out it looks like the saccades are normal, so it looks like this is not the case. Um, so here's an example of a, uh, a control uh, young man on the left and a patient on the right. Um, what I've plotted is in time on X, this is in seconds, so the duration of these saccades are 60, 70 milliseconds or so for the longest ones. Uh, and I'm plotting the velocity in X, which is in degrees per second on the Y axis. And they're all uh, aligned to the onset of saccades. And I'm basically taking, uh, for example, in this blue trace, all of the five-ish, five plus minus one or five plus minus two degree saccades. And I'm taking the velocity profile in time, and I'm averaging them all together and showing you what a typical five degree saccade looks like for this uh, healthy young man, and then similarly, the, what a typical five degree saccade looks like for this uh, patient with AT. Uh, and so what you see is, and so I'm plotting separately saccades that are about five, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 degrees uh, rightward, and then leftward are the, are the negative uh, velocity profiles. That's why you see negative velocities. Uh, and so what you see is that the, at least as far as, I picked two nice examples, but in general you see this as well, the velocity profiles in the patients look smooth. They don't look like they're abruptly terminated. Um, they look uh, pretty normal relative to the, to the controls. And I'm, I'll show you some ag aggregate statistics about across, across the population in a second. But basically, at least at a visual kind of gross level, the saccades look relatively normal, minus the fact that they don't like to make big saccades. So I picked someone who happens to have these 30-degree 30, 30 saccades just to show you guys. But in most of the patients, they, they as you saw in the previous plot, the, for a 40-degree target, they go 20 degrees. Uh, and so the, the maximum I get for most people is about 20. But up to those, the, the data that I have, the saccades look, look normal. So I'm not gonna, now going to try to show you some kind of aggregate statistics across the population for some of the, some of the parameters that we typically measure in saccades and, and try to hopefully convince you that their saccades look normal. So one measure that we often use is the peak velocity. So I showed you the velocity profile in time in the last figure. And one parameter we can just extract out of that velocity profile for every saccade that, the, that a person makes is the, the velocity, the peak velocity. Um, and that's a pretty typical measure. It has a pretty stereotypical relationship in an in individual. Um, and 
what I'm going to try to convince you of here is that the peak velocity in patients looks normal when I compare them to controls. Um, and so what you see uh, in, on the plot on the left is the amplitude of the saccade. I'm kind of grouping saccades again by, in this case, in bins of three degrees. So this is 18 plus minus one and a half degrees. This is uh, 15 plus minus one and a half degrees and so forth uh, for each point just to get some, be able to take an average uh, in, within an individual. And in the, sh the shaded regions underneath, which are somewhat hard to see, which I apologize for, is the, is the control population. And the, I split them up by age range. It turns out that this is, doesn't really have an effect on the, velocity, the, the peak velocity, but I, just for a kind of completeness, I split them up by age range. These are in red, not that you can see it super clearly, would be in kids from three to six years old. In orange would be six to nine, nine to 12, and so forth. Um, and so the control data is in the shaded regions underneath. And what I've plotted on top of that are the, uh, each line is a main sequence, this amplitude peak velocity relationship for a single patient. And so what you see when I look at the relationship between peak velocity and amplitude is that for the most part, the patient data has a nice smooth relationship with the true amplitude of the saccade. And it looks appropriate for the, uh, for the amplitude that they're making. And as compared to uh, controls, it's, it's about, about the same. Um, we know that in, in healthy people that uh, between, for example, you and I, there might be as large as a 50% difference in our peak velocity. So this, a few of the kids happen to be a little faster, but that's not um, unexpected given the given this variance that you see in a, in a typical population of healthy people. Um, I pointed out in one of the earlier slides that well, while peak velocity is a fine point at which to measure this statistic, Perhaps the saccades are getting aborted a little later, and maybe we're looking too late in the saccade. And maybe the, the velocity early in the saccade is the thing to look at, and that should look uh, appropriate. And then somehow it's going to get kind of quenched later. So we might expect a difference if I look very early in the saccade versus at the peak velocity. And so I'm just showing that on the right, um, uh, I take the velocity instead of at the peak, I take the velocity 10 milliseconds into the saccade, which is fairly early. And again, you see the control data under, in the shaded regions underneath, and the patient data, one line per patient on top, and for the most part, it looks like their, their velocities early in the saccade are um, normal as compared to controls. Um, we can look at a few other pretty kind of normally, or a few other measured parameters about the, the saccade dynamics to try to make the case that maybe their saccades are actually normal. There's not something wrong with them. Uh, on the left, you see the relationship between the amplitude of the saccade and the duration in milliseconds where I basically just take a velocity threshold and I say when they cross a certain threshold, that's the onset, and when they go below it, again, it's the offset. Um, so it's a little noisier, but, but, but you can see that, again, for the most part, the patients, which are in the lines, lie right on top of the, the shaded regions, which are the, the, control, is the control population. And the last thing um, I'm going to show um, is the skew. So uh, if I go back just for a moment and we look at the velocity profiles, oh, sorry. Um, the velocity profiles of, of large amplitude saccades are a little bit skewed in that they, they go up and then there's a little bit of a tail uh, in the velocity profile. This is normal. We see it in, in healthy people, as you can see, in, in the healthy person on the left. Um, and so one measure of saccade uh, dynamics may be the skew that it's sometimes looked at. And so one way we can assess the skew is we take the, the acceleration phase, the time to peak velocity, over the total duration. If, there's not, if you don't see this tail, you'd expect the skew to be one half. That is, they kind of rise for half of the duration and then they fall for the other half of the duration. Um, and if it's less than a half, it means that they have this tail. Oh. And so if you look at the data for the skew, again, I'm bidding by amplitude. Uh, and there's skew on the y-axis. One half, as you can see, is right up there. Um, for control individuals, you see that the skew increases. You have this longer tail that goes below 50%. Uh, as you have larger amplitude cards, and you see something similar in the patients, maybe a, a little bit different, though this is a, a less, uh, little noisier measure. So for the most part, I've showed you peak velocity, duration, and skew, this, and the velocity profiles themselves. Looks like patients maybe are making normal, appropriate saccades for the amplitude that they, that they are. Um, but I haven't, and, and so they, they look normal relative to controls, which is interesting, a little surprising given the, given the prior hypothesis. The last thing, though, that would be nice to be able to check, and I'm going to show you some data where we take a stab at this, is you know, maybe their, their saccade generators are just different, and so they're trying to go to the target, and they do it in a weird way, and so they happen to look normal. So we can, though, within an individual, try to ask whether they, um, they're trying to go to the target or they're trying to go, uh, the saccade's trying to go where it actually goes. Um, 
So um, uh, we're going to do an intersubject kind of analysis and trying to make the claim that saccades are appropriate for the amplitude that they are as opposed to the distance to the target. And again, what I'm plotting on x is the amplitude um, and the peak velocity on y. So first, I'm going to take the subset of saccades where the target is, suppose, 10 degrees away, and they actually go 10 degrees away. And say, what's the peak velocity? When target's 10 degrees away, they go 10 degrees away. In this case, there's really no ambiguity about whether they're trying to go to the target or they want it to go because they're the same. Um, so when you want to go to a target that's 10 degrees away, and you go to a target that's 10 degrees away, you make a saccade with a peak velocity that's about uh, 400 milliseconds. And this is all within, all within the patients. Next thing we can do is we can say, OK, let's take instead trials where they, the amplitude of the saccade was not equal to the target distance. They didn't go all the way there. This is going to be the majority of those saccades. And we can say, OK, let's take all uh, instances where this, the target was 10 degrees away. If they're trying to go to the target, we might expect that when the target's 10 degrees away, that's, that's really, they, they should move in the same way um, as, uh, Sorry, so if, 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 uh, if we take all instances where the target's 10 degrees away and aggregate them, uh, and we get the same relationship as we saw when they, when they both went to and wanted to go to, and the, and the target was all, when they both went 10 degrees away and the target was 10 degrees away, that would suggest that they're perhaps trying to go to the target. And you see that that's not the case. You get something very different, that when the target is 10 degrees away, they only, if I aggregate the saccades, they only have a peak velocity of 200 milliseconds, which is very different. If, on the other hand, I take these trials where the, where the target was some distance and they moved somewhere else, and instead I aggregate the saccades based on the actual amplitude, not the target distance, uh, it, looks, it turns out that the, the relationship between amplitude and peak velocity lays right on top of the, uh, the cases where they went directly to the target. So it's a little confusing, and I kind of stumble over it. But does that make any se make sense? Do people have questions? Do you want me to do that again? OK. Uh, so one other question. I'll answer the question. So what do you mean by amplitude not equal to target? target? Yeah. So first, we can think about if I have these two targets, and the eye starts off here. And first, I'm going to show in green cases where they go all the way to the target. So this is in green. I'm going to say, in this case, there's, I, I don't think there's any ambiguity between where you want it, where the target is, and if you're trying to go to the target and you're trying to go where the saccade lands, because they're the same, same thing. Next, I'm going to take saccades where they land somewhere else. So they, saccade lands here, target's over there. And I'm going to say, does the, ampl the amplitude peak velocity relationship look right for the amplitude of the saccade? Or does it look right for the target distance? Right, that's what I'm trying to separate. And um, it's nice because as a kind of a control, I can take cases where they're the same. And I can say, this is the nominal relationship for this patient where I'm kind of confident in what it should look like. And say, now when I take the movements and the trials where they didn't go straight there, does it look, the relationship will look correct if I think about the patients moving um, trying to move in a way based on their amplitude, or if I think about the patients trying to move to the target and having something get in the way. And so the, what you see is that the, the relationship when I think about the saccades as their true amplitude, which is in red, looks right. It matches up. But when I instead think about the saccades as trying to go to the target, it just looks very different. Does that make sense? Yes. So is it like saying it's as if the subject is intending to go halfway to the target. That is exactly what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the idea. Um, it's not that they're intending to try to go to the target, and it looks like they're intending to go halfway, based on the dynamics of the saccades. Exactly. Cool. Any other questions before I move on to the next bit? So in summary of this part, I've kind of showed you that patients with AT make a geometric series of saccades to shift their gaze. They go halfway a little more, and they go a little closer, and then a little closer. Um, and that the saccade dynamics look like they're appropriate for the saccade amplitude. And as you pointed out, it's kind of what came to my mind when I looked at this data. Maybe they're trying to go where they actually go. Maybe they're trying to go halfway. And so 
Perhaps this series of saccades that we observe isn't a deficit, it's not a problem in their saccades. Maybe it's somehow an optimal policy. Maybe it's something that they're doing intentionally because it's somehow good, it's somehow the right thing to do. Um, so we can think about why one might make a series of saccades. Um, and we can speculate these, these patients have ataxia. What if there's an increase in the signal-dependent noise of their movements? Again, if you remember from your homework, the last homework set, the gain of a saccade was related to the magnitude of the signal-dependent noise. So if I drastically increase the signal-dependent noise, which you might, might be the case in these patients, one might expect that the gain should go down. And maybe it goes down enough where we see this pretty significant change in the amplitude of their saccades. Um, and so as I, as I just said, that there's an expected change in the saccade gain for a single saccade with an increase in signal-dependent noise. Um, and so this is mostly taken from your homework um, with a slight tweak. So we can think about, for example, the position of the eye, X, as being a noisy um, result of making some command U with some signal-dependent noise. Um, and, um, and we can think again about a, a time cost, which we talk, think about durations as being linear in the amplitude of the saccade, uh, just like you guys did before. Uh, and that the total cost for making a saccade is some accuracy cost Jx and some time cost Jt. Um, where we have a squared accuracy cost, and then I'm using a, a hyperbolic cost of time uh, instead of a quadratic cost of time, which is what I think you guys had uh, before. Um, so we would expect, based on, based on the homework last night, that uh, they would have a smaller gain. Um, we can also think about what if you're allowed to make n saccades. So you're allowed to make more than one. Um, and so the way I've set that up, the, the solution to these equations ends up being the same thing you guys derived in class. So I wasn't going to go through, the, through the, the same derivation. It's just the Bellman equation. But I'll point out kind of how it works. Um, so we're going to think of a system where we have the position of the eye, x. And at, after the kth saccade, um, after the kth saccade, x, k is the position of the eye. And that position of the eye is the position you were at before you made the kth saccade plus the desired amplitude of the case of the cot, uh, which is u of k minus 1, and then plus that signal-dependent noise term. Um, so very similar to what you saw before, but I'm now allowing you to make several eye movements. Um, I'm going to assume that you start off at 0. That's not particularly important. Um, the duration of the saccades, again, is for each saccade, the duration of t, the duration t of uh, saccade k minus 1 is going to be some linear function of the amplitude of that saccade. Um, so, and this is important, the total duration is the sum of the durations of all the saccades. If I make three saccades, it's the sum of the durations. But there's also going to be some intersaccadic interval. Uh, and in order to um, kind of improve the, or one, one way to do this effectively is to make an eye movement, pause for long enough that you can see where you landed, and then make another eye movement. And then pause for long enough that you can see where you landed, make another eye movement. And so if you think about the, um, the total duration, it's going to be the, this doesn't work get a darker pen. It's going to be the duration of the first saccade. So I'm just plotting, again, gaze on y and something like time on x. It's going to be the duration of this first saccade plus some intersaccadic interval plus the duration of the next saccade plus some intersaccadic interval plus the duration of the third saccade. So if I allow three saccades, I have two intersaccadic intervals. So it's going to be n minus 1, the number of saccades minus 1, times the intersaccadic interval, ISI, um, plus the, uh, the duration of the, of the k saccades. Um, and there's some, again, cost of accuracy at the nth step. We don't really care about your accuracy after two, uh, uh, before that, we care about your endpoint accuracy. You want to be there at the end. Um, and so there's some total, and there's some total time cost, which is a hyperbolic uh, cost function, as you guys have discussed. Um, the other important point that, uh, that's a little slightly different in it uh, is that the, we assume that the system is fully observable so that you know where you landed. As I pointed out earlier, you, you make a saccade, you get to see where you landed, and then you make the next one um, uh, for the, this, the results that I'm going to show you. And so um, we'll start off by looking at what we would expect in control individuals. Um, if anyone's interested in the actual values of all the parameters, I have them. But, but the, the general qualitative results, I think, are what, what's, what are interesting. So, um, and so the way I solve this is just, actually, I used some of the notes from when I took the class. You can just use the Bellman equation to say, um, to find the optimal gain, the optimal policy. 
uh, given the signal dependent noise, given that you have n time steps, um, and you just, just solve the solve the, the system in the same way. Um, and so, uh, so if we can think about what the uh, what the behavior is of control subjects and what you might expect with an increasing number of saccades. So um, for a control individual, as you increase the number of saccades, they are more accurate. If I go you know, 95% of the way on the first saccade, making a second saccade is going to help me. Even if I'm 99% of the way on the second saccade, going, you know, making a third saccade is always going to help my accuracy. So there's really no penalty to accuracy for, being, for having more saccades. You obviously do better the more saccades you make. But the trade-off, as we know, is that there's a cost of time. And so doing things kind of slowly, indefinitely, isn't really ideal. You eventually actually would like to fixate the target and you know, move on with the rest of your life. And so we can think about a cost of accuracy that goes down with the number of saccades. We have a hyperbolic cost of time that goes up with the number of saccades. This is driven largely by the inner saccadic interval, because that's going to be much longer than the duration of an eye movement, which is fairly short. Um, and then we can take the total cost, which is shown in blue on the top line, and you see that the minimum for the total cost is going to be, in this case, that the optimum is going to make one saccade, as you, for the most part, observe in healthy people. If I instead, if I only increase the signal dependent noise in my, my simulations, um, the results are what you see on the right. So you can see that the, the time cost is the same for the two uh, sides. That is, it's a hyperbolic cost of time. It goes up with the number of saccades. It's driven largely by the interstochotic interval. Um, but the accuracy cost for making just one saccade is much, much larger because they have a greater signal dependent noise, as you would expect. Uh, and it indeed does come down with, an, with more eye movements. Again, it's fairly intuitive. But because this cost is so much higher for making large, a large single movement or two kind of large-ish movements, you actually see that the optimal policy is to make something like three-ish saccades, three, four saccades, which is kind of uh, what we see in the patient. So it's kind of nice that it works out that way. Um, but I haven't shown you that the patients actually have an increased signal dependent noise. So this is what the, the math predicts. The math says that if the patients have signal dependent noise, uh, a much increased signal dependent noise, uh, in this case, I think I increased by a factor of uh, three, two or three, um, uh, the, the results are about the same um, uh, for increases of about that magnitude. Um, and um, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you had a question. Sorry, yeah. Did these results change at all if you don't assume that the Uh, so as long as, 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 as it is long enough that you get feedback, these results are going to be about the same. If you make the interstochotic interval shorter significantly, obviously the time cost is going to shift a little bit because that drives the time cost. But as long as it's long enough that you can see where you are or see where you go, uh, the results are going to be the same. But um, I think the question is more than one of why, why do you have the assumption that the interstochotic interval is the same after each step? And the results that you had earlier, it seemed like there was actually like a variable length that got right. longer. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to change that much. Um, so if you saw the, the data, the inter I'll show you the spread of the interstochotic interval uh, in a couple of slides. Um, but uh, as, as, as long as it's not changing by an order of magnitude, you're going to still see an ascending cost of time. Um, on average, the expected cost of time is going to go up, uh, and the accuracy is going to go down. So it's going to trade off at close to this point. Um, I can make the interstochotic inter interval variable, but as long as it's about this magnitude, the expected value of the interstochotic interval is about what I use, which I use 300 milliseconds, which is what the, the data, or 400 milliseconds, which is what the data is. Um, if the expected value of the interstochotic interval is that, it's going to be, you're going to get very similar results. So normal people and your patients have the same uh, expected value? Yeah, I'll, I'll just skip to that since that's coming up. Uh, so um, what I'm going to show on this slide is the interstochotic interval. So as I said, for the, the model, I assume that they have a fully observable system so that they know where they land before they make the next saccade. I'm going to be plotting a histogram of the interstochotic interval when they make two saccades on a single trial. Um, and so for uh, control individuals and for patients, uh, it's just a histogram of the interstochotic interval. Frequency is on Y. Um, the mean of both, uh, so you see that they tend to not have interstochotic intervals less than interstochotic intervals less than about 100, 150 milliseconds, which is about what it might take for you to vis get visual feedback and plan a new saccade, more or less. Um, 
And the, the means of the interstochotic interval is fairly similar. It's 400 milliseconds in controls and 378 milliseconds in, uh, in patients. And um, the proportion of ISIs that are less than 150 milliseconds, just a cutoff I defined, uh, is, that, uh, is 5% in, in controls and 7% in patients. Um, and these distributions look, at least to the eye, similar. I don't think there's any uh, significant difference between them. Does that answer your guys' questions to some degree? Okay, so the, the two kind of premises of the, the model, the two assumptions, one is that they're pausing long enough to, to actually get feedback to make the next cut. That's what I just showed you. Um, and the second bit is that they actually have an increase in signal dependent noise, and it's about the right size to get this effect. Because if you know, the signal dependent noise goes up by 5%, that's not, uh, the simulations kind of are, or use an uh, increase that's much larger than that. If their signal dependent noise is going up by a thousand fold, then obviously you would expect some different behavior. Um, so um, here's the data. I'm going to try to measure signal dependent noise in two ways. Um, the first way is I'm going to take, uh, when they make a saccade in X, I'm going to say that the first saccade, I'm going to assume that they're trying to go to the same place, which is an assumption. And I'm going to say, the first saccade, where does it tend to land up for a given target amplitude uh, and a given individual? And then what's the variance of that uh, endpoint uh, for the individual? And I'm going to aggregate it across, across people. Um, and so what you see on, and I'm, I'm just grouping over both leftwards and rightwards saccades, so just taking the uh, leftwards and rightwards trial. So I'm taking the absolute value of the, of the target position and as a result, the saccade amplitude. So for controls, for example, they may make a saccade, you know, on average, their first saccade in some trials, maybe about 12 degrees or 12, 13 degrees, and they have some variance, uh, which goes up as the magnitude of the first saccade increases. So this is a nice demonstration that there is some sense of uh, signal dependent noise. Um, whereas if I plot the same data for control for the, for the patients, we see that the slope is much steeper. They have a much, uh, a much increased um, kind of rate of increase of the variance as, uh, as the amplitude of the saccade goes up. Um, yes? Are those two people or four These are, there's, I'm so, the MATLAB gummed up the labeling oh, and I made this figure like this afternoon, so <laughs> that's why I haven't cleaned it up. This is everyone, there's about 30 controls and about 10 patients. Oh. And I'm sorry that the, I just, I threw this figure in this afternoon, so I apologize for that. Um, this is all pretty fresh stuff, so. Um, the, uh, yeah, so it's, it's 30 controls and 10 patients yeah. grouped together, okay. Um, the other way we can look at it is we can say, okay, um, that, that first way assumes that they're trying to go to the same place on every, on every trial. Um, another way we can, we can look at it is because my targets are always aligned in X, they're always horizontal, the, it's, I think it's fair to assume that they're trying to make a saccade that's actually horizontal. And so we can look at the variance in Y as a function of the X amplitude as a, as a way to kind of measure it without having to assume, uh, assume that they're trying to go, or make, make some assumptions about where they're trying to go. And what you see is that it's a little noisier, but in controls that there's really not much variability in the, uh, there's not much change in the variability in the Y component. Um, but with patients, it goes up quite a bit. Um, so that when they're making, for example, a 20 degree saccade, there's a, a much larger variance in Y on average for a typical patient. Um, and as I pointed out, they have these uh, intrasychotic intervals that are uh, long enough where they could be getting visual feedback. Um, so together, at least they suggest that maybe, so we see that patients do have an increase in cell dependent noise, that the, they sit for long enough at each of the endpoints that they're, they could be getting visual feedback. So, and we know that if those two were the case, uh, an optimal feedback controller would would want to make three, four saccades, which is what we see in the patients. So uh, it kind of works out nicely that, uh, that the, the math kind of makes a prediction and that we see some evidence for those, that predictions in the, in the patient's data. Um, so in summary, the patients make a, this series of saccades to shift their gaze. Um, that series may be an optimal policy, not a deficit, based on the fact that their saccade dynamics look normal. Uh, and that an optimal policy with increased signal dependent noise actually is to make a series of saccades, and we do see that they have an increase in signal dependent noise in the patients. 
And that's basically it. Uh, just some acknowledgments. The patients are usually very generous. Many of them fly from very far away to come to Hopkins in general, and then they'll sit around, they'll stick around on their vacation uh, to do the experiments. Um, and uh, the, my lab, the MD PhD program, the AT Children's Center, and then the, our funding sources have all been very helpful and generous. So thank you guys, and I am also more than happy to take questions. More questions. Uh, often, yes. It'll take them uh, more than a second. Because if they make three saccades, the ISIs are about three, four hundred milliseconds. Um, it's going to be about a second uh, to go uh, shift their gaze, particularly for the large target. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this but how long it takes to actually get the So it depends on how in depth you mean by understand, but the visual signal is going to hit V1, I think, within 100 milliseconds or so. Uh, and uh, you can plan, I think, a second, a second saccade in 150, 200 milliseconds. It's pretty, pretty normal. Um, so that's why I kind of set the threshold of 150. That seemed like it was a reasonable number based on the time it takes for visual information to reach cortex. It may not actually be needed. It may not need to reach cortex, but, but to reach cortex. Uh, I think it's on the order of... Uh, these people uh, need to stop uh, for short periods of time because they to do that? You know, because they need to do many saccades, mm -hmm. they train themselves to you know, do all these fast things that are the case. To do... To, me to, to get the signal... Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they're getting visual feedback any faster than healthy people. I don't have any evidence for that. But I do think that, particularly since this is a developmental disorder, it's very reasonable that they've learned to uh, adopt this policy given the deficits in their system. Um, so in terms of having trained to do the behavior itself, I think that's possible. I don't know if they have trained, to your second question, I don't know if they've trained to get visual feedback any faster than healthy people. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, the answer is I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He's done the question. Have you thought of a reason why, the, why it is that they might have this increase in signal To some degree. So we know that the, the cerebellum, in many uh, examples, is involved in uh, kind of computing a forward model. So that is, when you make a command, I think you guys have talked about this to some degree, but when you make a command, um, the, it takes time for feedback to come back to your brain. And so it's useful to have a system that predicts what the consequences of that command are going to be. Uh, and we, it's thought that the cerebellum does, does that to some degree. Um, and these kids, we know, have a, a vastly shrunken cerebellum, and they have uh, ataxia. So perhaps they have an impaired forward model. They can't predict where they're going to go as well as you or I. And so as a result, they're not able to kind of compensate in advance uh, or compensate before they get feedback. And so then that would predict that they should have an increase in the, in the signal dependent noise. Because for larger commands, um, you know, the other parts of the system have an increase in signal dependent noise, and you can't correct for those factors. So that, that actually, that, that is consistent. That might be the one reason why they have an increase in signal dependent noise. Does this sort of, and this is just like a curiosity question, yeah. but does this sort of like change in the pattern of saccades have really any practical, uh, cause any practical deficits for these kids relative to other results of like, that are kind of common in the cerebellar lesions? as a result of that kind of destruction of the forward model? So for these kids, and specifically for their eye movements, if that's what we can focus on, uh, I don't know if the series is necessarily the, the issue, but the, the increase in noise certainly is. So for example, when you read, reading is a classic example. These are children, they're in school. When you read, reading involves moving your eye very accurately from one part of a word to another part of a word, or from one word to the next word. And because they have an increase in the variance of their eye movements, excuse me, it's difficult for them to land right on the word after one movement, and so they'll have to sometimes make two or three, and it takes them a second to get from word to word, so reading is slower, it's more effortful, they have to remember what they, the word that they read before much more than you or I would, and as a result, particularly in the patients that have uh, worse eye movement deficits, reading can be quite fatiguing and quite difficult, and so in practice, they, a lot of them use audiobooks and that sort of thing, but that's one um, practical clinical consequence of, the, of, the, of this phenotype. Yes. 
value seems to decline, so the movement becomes slower. And I'm wondering, in, in your model, if the cost of time were to be high, of course, you, 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 know, you get you get less of that than the cost of time is low, you can buy it slower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you see, and I think the prediction would be that the kids, if there's a significant change in the cost of time, like the beginning of the to the end of the study, then you do more, then the series of stats would be longer at the end of the study than the beginning of the study. Uh, if time is less costly, then they should make more saccades. Yeah. So basically, um, the first yeah. saccade, the amplitude of the first saccade would become smaller as the experiment proceeds. So the uh, if the cost of time has changed, it has to change, because this is a kind of a discrete thing, it has to change a fair bit. Um, and there's enough noise, if, I, if you remember from the examples, there's enough noise uh, in kind of trial to trial where the saccades land. Um, so I'm not sure that I have, I can look at that specifically. I haven't actually looked at the first half and second half to say that convincingly. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at the first half and second half to say that convincingly, but it's an inch, that, that's, that is the prediction, that if you significantly change the cost of time, within an individual or perhaps across individuals that you should see a shift in the number of saccades people make. That's exactly true. And Ms. question. Yeah, of Why course. Why do we blink our eyes so often? Why do we blink our eyes so often? So blinking, blinking serves in part to hydrate the, the, the sclera and cornea. So the sclera and cornea are not particularly, particularly your cornea is not well, well vascularized. You don't have blood vessels that run across your cornea. That would be bad. You wouldn't be able to see. Um, and so it's not well vascularized, and so it's not hydrated, it's not, you know, and so to hydrate those cells, you need, that's in part one of the reasons why one might blink, um, is to hydrate the cornea. And that's why if you don't blink or you have dry eyes from a medical condition, one of the major uh, consequences is corneal abrasions. That's the bad thing that happens if you don't, if you have dry eyes. So, random, but that's, I think, the answer. Um, this just might be, the, I mean, as you said, like the model probably wouldn't, see, the result wouldn't significantly change with this. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to the slide with the um, intersacrotic intervals, yeah. um, those histograms are pretty, like, apparently bimodal. And again, yeah. from your plot, it's pretty obvious that the intersacrotic intervals are different over the course of the trial. If you separated those out for, like, intersacrotic interval for the first saccade and intersacrotic interval for the second saccade, it looks like you'd be able to separate those. So uh, that's separate the modes in those plot, which might it probably will give you the same result, but it might be an augmentation you could mm -hmm. make to the model in terms of actually having the intersaccadic intervals be fixed values, but be different for after each saccade. So actually, that's a good question. I actually have I've looked at this. I've done these histograms for first saccade, second saccade, and I don't have very many third saccade in control, so it's not easy to it's right. not as meaningful to do that. Uh, and it's not that the first saccade is always one mode and the second, uh, or the first ISI is one mode and the second ISI is another. This happens to be the example that I picked, um, but, uh, but that's not always the case. Okay. Uh, you see a similar shape, obviously it's smaller numbers, so it's a little noisier, but similar shape for just the first saccade distribution and just the second saccade distribution, or second ISI distribution. That's a good question. More questions? Miscellaneous questions? Cool, thank you.